All right. So as I was saying, as we get going again, we're, everything from the last unit really starts to bridge together. And what this unit is essentially, guys, is the immediate causes and the effects of the American Civil War, which is going to happen between 1861 and 1865. From the last unit, when we talk about Manifest Destiny, what's happening over the course of the 1800s is this confluence of events of, of what's ultimately going to long-term cause the Civil War, which is the growing of the United States. Okay, and as it grows, is this going to be a slave state? Is this going to be a free state? Is this going to be an economy based on agriculture, is it going to be an economy based on industry and how the sectionalism of the North and South divides based on who's got better roads, who's got better industry, what's the tariff situation and so on and so on. And, you know, it really starts to come to a head uh, from a socialist movement from a from a social movement of what we're going to call the 19th century reform movement. So what's going on in terms of how the everyday people, what is changing the mindset of the people in the 1800s? And some of this is going to be good and some of it's going to further exacerbate the slavery issue. And that's what we'll talk about today. So, you know, be able to evaluate these reform movements and what happens. So a lot of these reform movements start in the 1800s, uh, you know, and a lot of it happens for morality reasons. So people want uh, equality, opportunity, equality for women, equality for free blacks. Um, and then another thing happens in the 18, late 1830s to the 1840s called the Second Great Awakening. And if you remember anything from world history studying the original Great Awakening, is it supposed to be this spiritual movement influenced by Christianity, obviously, um, that, you know, God is your saving grace and your moral comp conscience and everything. And through this second great awakening, it obviously brings some deeper questions in life come about such as, um, You know, is slavery more moral? Is holding women back, is that moral? How should we treat the mentally ill? How should we treat prisoners? And it inspires people to make the world better immediately than waiting for an afterlife. Everybody with me? So the first movement we'll talk about is the temperance movement. And essentially, guys, the temperance movement is they want to moderate the use of alcohol because we as whiskey becomes cheaper and more available, um, as financial problems happen in the 1830s and 1840s throughout the country, uh, as Native Americans begin being consumed by alcohol, alcoholism, um, you know, the temperance movement is people who either want to abstain or make the use of alcohol harder. It did succeed in convincing several states prohibiting its sale um, now, we are going to totally outlaw uh, distribution of alcohol in the 1920s. Don't, don't mistake the temperance movement with what's later going to be American prohibition. All right? The next thing is women's rights, and it's important. So as suffrage in the 1800s had gotten better, primarily thanks to the Jackson presidency, it was mainly still just white men, right? So women are trying to gain the right to vote, hold public office, whatever, serve on juries, however the case may be. Um, and in the North, primarily, women open up these ideas of abolition, meaning it's not really right to own slavery. And women like Sojourner Truth, who famously writes the poem, Ain't I a Woman? And she was a black woman, and we'll, we'll examine her a little bit more on Monday, but women made up the majority of these northern abolitionist societies, um, you know, like Sojourner Truth and Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. All of these are advocates for women's right to vote. And then the Grimke sisters uh, who were um, actually Southerners who saw slavery for the evil that it was. 
in these experiences of fighting slavery and the ab abolition of slavery inspired them to begin to work for their own rights. Uh, the two most famous ones are Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And what happens with these two women, they go to London and they attend a convention of the world's anti-slavery movement. And while they're there, they're actually forced to sit behind a curtain in the balcony. So, you know, in the ironic truth of the fact that you're fighting and you're speaking for the freedoms of slaves across the world, you couldn't even go sit and listen to the meeting where, where all the men could. Everybody with me. So what they do is they inspire and organize the first women's rights convention, which is called the Seneca Falls Convention. Uh, the Seneca Falls Convention essentially is the goal was held in 1848 and women it, it starts this women's rights movement and for 70 years you know the the people of elizabeth Cady stanton and lucretia mott they ultimately work toward trying to get america to the what becomes the 19th amendment which you'll study in american history too but that movement along with the temperance movement is starting then and then you have susan b anthony uh who's fighting for more things other than right to vote, equal pay with men, access to higher education, uh, change in property and divorce laws. Because let's just say, and guys, I'm not trying to embarrass him, but I got William and Carla in front of me. If Carla was bestowed land, okay, in the 1800s from her dying parents as a 15 year old girl, and six years later she married William, then that land all of a sudden becomes William's. Everybody with me? All right. So, you know, the, the land eventually, when a woman marries, she ceded all property to men. They're fighting to try and get those laws changed as well. Uh, she co founds the National Women's Suffrage Association with Elizabeth Cady Stanton as the ultimate goal being for the right to vote. Now we're talking about improving social institutions. Prisons, guys, basically prisoners were treated like dogs. I, and the prison reform movement is basically we're trying to improve souls instead of punish bodies and they support the idea of rehabilitation. Meaning you're there because you did something wrong or you did something harmful, but you know, we want to try and rehabilitate you so that when you get out, and we're not talking about murderers at this point, guys, we're talking about just basic criminals. Everybody with me? So try and return a criminal to life by training them how to work, teaching them personal discipline, and ultimately not treat them like animals when they get in there. And then a really famous woman is a lady named Dorothea Dix. Um, and what she's trying, if you were mentally handicapped, guys, and what people would have used as the R word, um, I, I will not use that word. Um, mentally handicapped, mentally ill, they were all oftentimes seen as criminals and sent to prisons when a sense is they were just sick. Everybody with me? I mean, they had a disability. Um, so a lot of times the mentally handicapped were confined in chains and kept in these horrible conditions. But Dorothea Dix ends up causing states across the United States. She does all this research and states begin building mental institutions and mental hospitals all across uh, the country at that point. Like, for instance, the, the Mentally Handicapped Hospital in North Carolina, it's not even a hospital, it's a reform area, is named after Dorothea Dix. Okay, so you'll need to know who she is. Then school reform, guys. I, all schools in the set up until the 1800s are privately funded. What starts to happen in the late 1700s and the early 1800s is that we start pushing for common public education systems led by the state and like North Carolina, the University of North Carolina was the first public university in the United States. The University of Virginia, the University of South Carolina, all of these state universities start to pop up. And then what happens is the North Carolina public school system starts to take root, which is what you guys are a part of now. Everybody with me? And it was supposed to offer free education to anybody. And it was on, anybody got an idea why we got to school for 180 days? It started during this time period because it was based on the agrarian calendar. Kids were going to be out in the summer so that they could help harvest the fields. 
everybody with me. And the first guy, the most important guy as it relates to education is a guy named Horace Mann. Okay, so he's the first head of the Massachusetts Board of Education. He lengthens the school year, improved curriculum and teacher training, and then he is called the father of really the American public school education system. Then you have these specialty schools that are designed for deaf and blind children, you know, um, for for disabled groups in society. So it gave all it gave literally guys through the eighteen hundreds the idea is to give every I say every kid every free man and girl a chance. All right. And then the last thing I hit on is like this idea of a utopian society so so what happens is guys is this this really takes place in the north a lot more than the south people try to create these utopian communities uh communes if you will um the name comes from a book from sir thomas moore and it, it describes this imaginary place without poverty crime and injustice Utopian societies don't work, but they start breaking out all over um, America during this time period. New Harmony, Indiana, which is supposed to be this religious utopia. People held property in common, successful, but did not last. Last, uh, It didn't last, number one, because members were celibate. That means they didn't have sex. They didn't reproduce. So, I mean, do the math there. People die. So no children are born. It's not going to survive. You have Brook Farm, uh, which is a transcendentalist uh, utopian society in Massachusetts. Um, you know, it's the problem is, is that a utopian society, and even now as we start talking about communism and socialism, what these soci societies don't do, they don't take into account human nature. All right? And the idea that we're all going to get the same thing no matter how hard we work how hard we don't work everybody with me because what ends up happening is disagreements over pay or or um you know you resent people who get the same thing that you get even though you might work harder uh so these things really don't work but this is an idea of what a utopian or shaker community look like and you guys can see they're really centered around uh, the northeast and the midwest there's not a whole lot of that uh going on in the south um the most famous one is the Oneida community up in, in Western New York. And it's based on uh, a mixture of religious and social principles. Freedom from sin could be obtained by communion with God. Uh, renunciation of purpose. They don't get married. They practice complex marriages. Community leaders attempted to produce healthy and intelligent offspring guys. I mean, it's that's a little different but what i really want you to know is the we're going to study the abolition movement which is the abolishment i heard the people who worked for the abolition of slavery we're going to get into that really deep on monday but just to give you guys an idea of the, the great awakening um in, in the religious movement that essentially spearheads a lot of these ideas to try and make a cleaner and freer society uh of people for everyone, all right, and it, the social conscience um, starts to move during this time period, and um, so that's that's what I've got for today. I am going to show. Um, let me stop sharing real quick. I am going to uh, 